Okay, thank you. Uh, unlike uh, many of the previous speakers here, I'm a card-carrying engineer. And not only do I teach engineering at the University of California, but I also uh, do research there on glucose control and uh, improvements in sensor design. And I also have a company named Glysense, which I'm a co-founder of. And uh, this is by means of full disclosure. And the company's main mission is to make a long-term implanted glucose sensor that is acceptable to the most number of people. Uh, the word glycens is a conjunction of glycemia and sensor. So uh, let's see. Let's go to the next slide. Now, I want to show a few slides that are historic. This slide here was given to me by my postdoctoral mentor when I was a, a student at Jocelyn Clinic. Uh, and it was made in the 1970s. And uh, it shows the vision of uh, implanted, oops, pardon me, pushing the wrong buttons here, implanted glucose sensor as it was envisioned in those days. And so uh, here is a glucose electrode. Oh, pardon me. Engineers don't know how to use these things. <laughs> uh, here is a glucose electrode or glucose sensor. Here's a power supply, which would be something like a battery. Here's a transmitter device, a telemetry device, uh, that would send a signal through the scan. This is implanted under the skin, and here's an external receiver. Uh, this is the vision of a cell phone in its day. And uh, this is the dream of many people for a long time. <laughs> okay. And uh, going beyond that, this is the implantable artificial pancreas, which uh, this, this slide is also vintage 1970. And here's a glucose sensor, a glucose electrode, power supply, computers, of course. Uh, it was just a dream in those days. Uh, an insulin pump and an insulin reservoir that you could refill through the skin with a syringe. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> people have been thinking about these ideas for, for quite a long time. And of course, these slides were made in a time when engineers were using vacuum tubes to make electronic gadgets. So you can imagine. Uh, how much advance was needed. Now, uh, what could you do if you had a glucose sensor? Well, a lot of people have already discussed that here today, but I just want to reiterate, for people who have type 1 diabetes, uh, you could do insulin dosing, as Bruce just said. Importantly, you could do hypoglycemia detection and or warning. Okay? Uh, the artificial pancreas is it's crucial to have a glucose sensor for the artificial pancreas. And the idea of having wireless connectivity is, is very appealing and exciting. If you had type 2 diabetes, you might also be able to use a glucose sensor, real-time glucose monitoring. Uh, you might be able to adjust your medication. Uh, for women who are gestational diabetics, they might be able to use a glucose sensor for fetal weight management. Okay. Uh, you might even consider possibly using it for body weight management. You know, most of us are not aware of what happens to our blood glucose when we eat a certain kind of food and how high it goes and how rapidly it goes and how slowly it comes down. So this would uh, be educational for all of us. We might be able to use that effectively. Of course, there's a big interest in using glucose sensors in clinical care monitoring during surgeries and uh, deliveries. And you could even use a glucose sensor in conjunction with the other proposed therapies that have been discussed today, the biological therapies like stem cells and islets, transplants even. Although it wouldn't be directly connected to them, it would be supportive of those technologies. So there's plenty of things you could do with one if you had one. Now, uh, there have been literally thousands of attempts to make glucose sensors over the years, and some have been successful. Uh, but they fall into several categories here. There are sensors that work, okay, but have limited acceptability by the users, typically. And just to give you an example of what I mean here, finger sticking. Most people don't really like finger sticking very much, but they often do it. The complaint I have about finger sticking is that you can't do it frequently enough to follow your blood glucose, glucose dynamics. It's just not practical. And so there's plenty of information that's lost by finger sticking even though it's a very uh, useful technology in some sense. There are subcutaneous needle sensors that you insert under the skin. They're commercially available and used by large numbers of people. Um, 
These devices uh, have the obvious problem that they have to be inserted and they have to be, they last for several days to a week or so. And you still have to do finger sticking to calibrate these devices. So they, they work, but they're, you know, there's uh, limited interest in those in general from the diabetic public. In Europe, there's a lot of people who use the microperfusion devices, which are a very small hollow fiber that you insert through the skin and then back out, and you have an external uh, glucose monitoring device, and then you pump fluid through that uh, loop, and it collects the fluid and measures glucose, and that has obvious uh, downsides. Now, there's a second group of uh, devices, sensors that could be very acceptable to people, but basically don't work. And uh, in this category, I list the non-invasive optical sensors. The, the idea here is you have some kind of a device that you shine a light on your, your hand or your earlobe or through your eye some way. And uh, this light can detect glucose uh, based on its spectral characteristics and so on. Now, this idea was stimulated by the medical tricorder of Star Trek Vintage, okay? And uh, I put it up here as uh, it would be very acceptable to most people. It's the simplest possible version of it. There has been an enormous investment in developing some kind of optical non-invasive glucose sensor. Uh, the investment has been by the federal government, but much, much larger by private industry, okay? And it has been unsuccessful to date. Uh, part of the problem is that there are some fundamental barriers that are still there, and they, uh, people who are investigating these things bump up against this bar this, these barriers. Now, um, <clears throat> the uh, problem is also exacerbated by our tradition in publishing in the scientific literature. Um, you know, the problem is that you can only publish positive results, especially in the engineering literature. And uh, people who have negative results uh, really can't get published. So what happens is uh, new investigators come along all the time. They discover the idea. They decide they're going to work on it. And there's often a lot of publicity about their research and so on. And then they bump into the brick wall that many, many other investigators have bumped into, okay, making it specific for glucose. Um, and then they abandon the project and quietly walk away. And then a new investor comes along and repeats this cycle over and over again. So <clears throat> that contributes to some of the lack of progress in this field. Um, there will not be a non-invasive optical glucose sensor in our lifetime. It's pretty clear of that. So that's the situation. Now, there are sensors that measure glucose in external body fluids, such as uh, saliva, tear, sweat, and so on. Um, these devices uh, are really only qualitative, and they don't make really accurate glucose measurements because we produce variable amounts of these fluids. Uh, there are sensors that measure secondary effect, effects of glucose. Uh, when glucose is perfused in the tissues, it causes a very slight warming of the tissue, for example. Uh, these are not specific for glucose, and there are many uh, false positives that can occur as well from that. Uh, the need still is there. There's a need for a specific glucose sensor uh, that works and that it could be acceptable to a large number of people. So that's what I want to talk about, if I can. Now, uh, much has been said in praise of the pig today. And I want to continue with that, that part of the story, OK? I'm going to tell you about the Glycens UCSD long-term subcutaneous implanted glucose sensor with telemetry. And these are the experimental animals we use. And this gives you a, an image of the sensor itself that's implanted in this animal to show you the size of it. And uh, we've implanted these, implant, these devices in pigs for up to 18 months, working continuously. Their performance is comparable to the sensors that are presently used in clinics that are percutaneous. There's no change in the performance over time, as I'll show you. Uh, the cosmetics are obviously excellent here. Uh, there are no, we've had no adverse medical effects in, in these animals. And there's a lag of about nine minutes, which is well within the time needed to accurately follow blood glucose. Now, uh, many people ask, well, why do we choose the pig as an experimental animal? And there are two very important reasons. One is the skin in the pig is very much like the skin in the human is connected to the underlying tissues. 
as opposed to the skin in dogs or mice or other experimental animals, hamsters, so on, where the skin is very loosely connected. And the other uh, reason is that pigs are very lovable and affectionate animals, and you can really establish a relationship with them. <laughs> uh, so this is what the device looks like up close. It's got a titanium can. There's a, a ceramic plate with sensors on the top here. Inside is a battery, some circuit plates. Uh, there's an antenna on one side of this. There are multiple sensors, multiple glucose sensors uh, on, the, uh, on the plate on the top here. Data is sent by this device every two minutes. It has a 10-foot transmission range as it's configured at present. The battery life is over two years. Uh, it doesn't require frequent recalibration, and that's a very important uh, positive of this. It's implantable by a simple uh, outpatient procedure. You make an incision with local anesthesia, create a small pocket, insert the device, and sew up. And that can be done in a couple of minutes. Now, this panel shows you the kind of data that we've obtained in the pigs. And the top panel here is when the pig is non-diabetic. And then the bottom panel is when the pig's diabetic. And this shows glucose concentration on the vertical axis. And these are days. And this is one continuous tracing. It goes on from here and goes back to here and so on. And this is just an example taken from day 174 to day 195 in the pig. And the red line here is the translated, uh, the transmitted uh, subcutaneous glucose concentration from the implant. And uh, <clears throat> every week or twice a week, there was a need to give a pig, this normal pig a big infusion of glucose in order to cause its blood glucose to rise and fall. And of course, this, this is shown here. And of course, the glucose goes way up when we do that. And then these pigs produce a lot of uh, insulin naturally and drop it right back down. And these blue spots are blood glucose values taken by a, a gold standard sampling method during that period. Uh, now this pig, uh, this study here, went on for over a year. And then we converted the pig into a diabetic by giving streptozotocin here and continued on for another half year. Now this uh, panel was chosen because it shows you the calibration adjustment time here. The sensor really doesn't require recalibration very frequently at all. Now after the pig becomes diabetic, the story is quite different. It's still a glucose on this side, and this time is one day, just expanded the scale because there's so much more detail in it. And this particular tracing starts on day 375 after implantation and goes to the, the end of that day, 376. And here you can see the, blood, uh, the tissue glucose concentration going up and down dramatically during the day. Now, uh, in the uh, normal non-diabetic pig, uh, the animal is quite impressive because they can eat large amounts of food. They convert that directly into body mass without the inefficiency of blood glucose excursions. In contrast to humans, if we eat a big meal, we're going to have a big blood glucose excursion. Uh, <clears throat> And we are probably not as efficient as a pig in converting that to body mass, although some of us are pretty good at that. After they become diabetics, then you can see they have all kinds of problems. So uh, that is why we needed to give glucose here to actually see if the sensor was really working during those periods. Uh, but it's pretty obvious, of course, when they're, when they're diabetic. So this study went on for 520 days. The sensors have functioned in the pig for that long one year as a non-diabetic, and then another six months as diabetic. Only occasional recalibration is needed. When we use this in humans, we don't want the patients to be readjusting the calibration at all, and it won't be needed for these kind of sensors. Uh, a collective total of 31 device years in pigs uh, we have been attained here, with 17 of these implanted devices operating for more than a year. Okay. Uh, now, this is all based on some fundamental advances, which I won't explain in the area of enzyme stability, in oxygen sensor design and stability, and in implant biocompatibility. It didn't just happen overnight. Uh, now, a, uh, all, met, all uh, electronic devices, as you know, with time, subsequent versions get smaller. They have greater capabilities and uh, become fancier. 
And so uh, a smaller, substantially smaller version of this implant is now under development. It will have the same lifetime characteristics, but it will have a number of additional features and sensing capabilities than the present one. Studies of this device are presently underway in humans, and we expect the device to be ready uh, within a few years for general application in humans. So. <clears throat> I have to thank collaborators. Uh, my colleagues at the university helped a lot, in particular the people at Glycens that have built the device and tested and, and done some of the design of it. And this work was largely funded by the uh, grants to, the UCS, to UCSD and grants to Glycens from the NIH, NIDDK, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, Department of Defense, the National Institutes of Standard and Technology. And these are the people that actually do the work. Okay. And I'm going to quit at that point. Thank you. <laughs>